Hi, my name is Sebastian Matteau and in this set of video tutorials I would like to show you how to do deep learning, so how to work with deep neural networks in Python with the Python library Keras. Now the tutorials are going to be very focused on coding, so we're very quickly going to work with Python code to actually make neural networks. Uh, but before we do that in the next tutorial, I want to take this introduction to briefly introduce some of the basic concepts and terminology related to deep learning, because that will make the coding part that will follow much easier to understand. You will have a better idea of what you're doing. Now, all of these tutorials have a written counterpart on python.coxi.nl. So if you want to uh, find the code, find back the code that we will write during later, tutor later tutorials, or you want to so calmly read back what I will be telling you during this tutorial, then you can find it there on python.coxi.nl. So let's start with the question, what is a biological neural network? The most familiar biological neural network is of course our own brain. Now, what is a brain? A brain is, among, among many things, a collection of neurons, and neurons are brain cells. And the human brain has about 100 billion neurons. This is just a very rough estimate, an order of magnitude estimate. Um, and these neurons are connected to each other. And these connections in the, in, the, in the biological brain are called synapses. And the human brain has about 100 trillion synapses. So that means that there are about 1000 synapses for every neuron. This in turn means that the brain is quite sparsely connected, right? It is, there are many, many, many connections, but it is certainly not the case that every neuron is connected to every other neuron in the brain. It is a sparsely connected network. Artificial neural network takes some of these principles from a biological neural network and turns them into software. That's the idea. So an artificial neural network is also a collection of neurons, sometimes called nodes in this context. And these neurons are also connected to each other. Um, so in that sense, there is some kind of similarity. And the idea is, of course, that the, or the hope is that if we create artificial neural networks that somewhat resemble the human brain, that maybe they will also be able to perform the very complicated tasks that we with our human brain are able to perform. That is kind of the promise of artificial neural networks. And to some extent, there has been a bit of success, especially in the field of image classification. So what makes, an, what makes a deep neural network different from an artificial neural network in general? So what you're seeing now is a, an artificial neural network, and it actually is the neural network that we will create in the next tutorial. And you will see that this is a shallow network because it consists of only three layers. There is one input neuron, and that one input neuron feeds information into eight, uh, eight neurons in a hidden layer, and those eight neurons in the hidden layer feed again their output into two output neurons in the output layer. Um, so this is a three layer network. Some of you might recognize this if you've done some AI courses as a multi-layer perceptron. And this is not a deep neural network. However, a deep network is simply a network kind of like this, but then with many more layers. Um, so a deep neural network, a deep network will generally have dozens of layers or perhaps even up to 200, something like that. And that's basically what makes a network deep. There is nothing, there is nothing qualitatively different between these kind of simple neural networks that we're looking at now and that we will create during the first tutorial and deep neural networks, except the, their depth, the number of layers. You will also hear, quite often hear people refer to uh, convolutional neural networks. Now, what does, what does that mean? We will actually work with the convolutional neural network during the third and the fourth tutorial, a network called MobileNet. Um, and what exactly makes these networks convolutional? Well, you've seen already that a network, an artificial neural network, consists of layers, right? And in this, in this simple example that we gave, we had three layers, and those layers were so-called densely connected layers. What does that mean? It simply means that every neuron in a layer is connected to all of the neurons in the layer above it. So it's densely connected. There are also other kinds of layers. For example, there is a layer type called max pool that sort of downsamples the layer above it. So there are different kinds of layers that perform different kinds of computations in a, in a neural network. And a convolutional layer is one of these layer types. And I already touched upon the fact that in the human brain, 
certainly not every neuron is connected to every other neuron, right? So the human brain, the biological brain is not made up of densely connected uh, uh, layers, certainly not. And the convolutional layer somewhat approximates that by, I will, I will say it in a very simplistic way, but basically a convolutional layer is a layer in which each neuron is only connected to a few neural layers, neurons in the layer above it. And the advantage of that is that it reduces the number of connections um, in the network, of course, and it also makes the network structure resemble the structure of a biological brain a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, so, so why do people sometimes use the terms deep learning or deep neural networks and convolutional neural networks interchangeably? Well, simply because most deep neural networks have convolutional layers in them, and most networks that have a convolutional layer are deep. And in that sense, the two terms are, can be used somewhat interchangeably, but they refer to very different aspects of the architecture of a model. So, uh, in the beginning, I already said that the promise of uh, artificial neural networks is that they can perform some of the tasks that the brain or biological neural network also can. Um, so then an interesting question is, of course, to what extent are contemporary deep neural networks comparable in their size and in their abilities to biological neural networks? Now, and then... We can take, for example, just to have a reference, we can take the largest, the largest neural network that is included with Keras, the Python library that we will use, and that network is called VGG19, and that network consists of about 150 million parameters. So a parameter is then the weight of a connection or the bias parameter, sort of a baseline level of activity of the neurons. In other words, <clears throat> the number of parameters is equal to the sum of the number of neurons and the number of connections. Now, remember that I said that the biological, the human brain, consists of 100 trillion uh, synapses and about 100 billion uh, neurons. Now, even if we make the hugely simplifying assumption that every synapse can be modeled as one value, one parameter, like in a deep neural network, and that every neuron can similarly be modeled as one value. Even then, with that hugely simplifying assumption, the brain is still a million times larger than VGG19. And in general, the brain is many, many orders of magnitude larger than contemporary deep neural networks. So the complexity of these networks is enormous, but it does not come close to the human brain. That being said, there are organisms, for example, uh, insects, take a bee, for example, that have a brain that is roughly comparable in size to these largest artificial neural networks, to these largest deep networks. Um, roughly, right? Because clearly we're comparing apples and oranges if we start comparing software and wetware, right? Biological brains. But roughly, they are sort of the same size. Does that mean, therefore, that VGG19, to name one of these large neural nets, is just as intelligent as a bee? And then my tentative answer to that is that basically you, there, that is an unanswerable question. At present, uh, an artificial neural net like VGG19 is very good at a very specific task, image classification, for example. And there, it vastly outperforms a bee. I don't think bees are very well able to do fine-grained image classification. So in that sense, perhaps VGG19 is more intelligent than a bee. But on the other hand, bees, and that is true for every organism, even with very tiny brains, are able to have a lot of flexibility in their behavior. They are able to adapt to their situation in incredible ways, uh, even though they have a very tiny brain. And this, they're able to switch from one task to the, to the next. They're able to learn new things, etc rather than a, just being able to learn new things in the context of a task that they were already able to perform, so to say. So, this, and this, this cognitive flexibility, that currently is very much lacking in the deep neural networks. But I think it's a challenge, and also conceivable that there will be success in that department. It is a challenge for artificial intelligence and psychology and cognitive neuroscience to actually see how we can take that, that cognitive flexibility that is so characteristic of animals, even very simple animals, and how we can actually transfer that to deep neural networks. 
That, of course, goes very far beyond the scope of this, uh, these tutorials where I just basically want you to hit the ground running and being able to implement and work with uh, neural networks in Keras. So um, let's get started. Before we actually get started, um, a quick note about the, the libraries that we're going to use. The first is a toolkit called TensorFlow. That is sort of a low level uh, library for machine learning and deep learning uh, created by Google. Um, and you can think of that kind of as the NumPy for, uh, NumPy for machine learning. So why not just use NumPy directly? Well, because TensorFlow has a few tricks up its sleeve that NumPy doesn't or not to the same extent. So for example, TensorFlow can easily make use of the graphical processors in your graphics card and Tensor which speeds up computation. And that's a good thing because, because deep learning is incredibly uh, computationally expensive. And uh, TensorFlow also provides some routines for differential calculus, which is the branch of mathematics uh, that is important for training deep neural networks. But don't worry though, we are not going anywhere near differential calculus in these uh, tutorials. But it's, it is happening under the hood, so to say. So we will actually not use TensorFlow directly but we are going to use Keras, and Keras is a high level library that is sort of built on top of TensorFlow. And Keras provides a lot of uh, functions and modules that make it really easy, and I would say surprisingly easy, to work with artificial neural networks in, uh, in Python. And Keras also provides a number of, uh, of built-in neural networks that you basically can just download and use straight away. Okay, so I hope you're ready to start coding. I've already been talking for way too long, I think. It's really time to get to the code. So hope to see you in the next, for the next tutorial and have fun. <laughs>